So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them to the book of Acts, chapter 12. The book of Acts, chapter 12. We're going to begin in verse 20 in a few moments. As you're turning there, I have a question for you. And just kind of shout out some simple answers, if you would. What is your greatest fear? Just one. What is your greatest fear? Anybody? Want to admit it? Maybe you don't want to admit it because you don't want to be. What? Your parents dying? Okay. Snakes, drowning, okay. Anybody else? Heights. Your parents dying? Getting attacked by a bear? Okay, that's why you live in Missouri, that's good. What'd you say down here? Somebody said spiders or something? Small what? Oh, small spaces, yeah, claustrophobia. All right, well, okay, yeah, go ahead. Snakes, yep, and other snakes. I'm, I'm disappointed more people didn't say snakes. So think about that great, and whatever it was, maybe you, maybe you thought of something, you don't want to yell it out, that's fine, but how do you deal with your greatest fear? What would your answer be to that? How do, you, how do you overcome that greatest fear? How do you deal with it? Face it head on, okay. Anybody else? How do you deal with your greatest fear? What do you do? Shoot it, yeah, depending on what it is. Depending on what it is, perhaps shoot it is okay. Chop its head off if it's snakes, okay. All right, we're probably going to end this conversation now, just in case we get in a little bit of a wrong direction that I didn't want to go in. But okay, but think about because of, because of fear and difficulty, a lot of people, when it comes to things like this, they fall into hopelessness, don't they? The world can be dark, the world can be devastating, the world can be full of things that cause us to fear or cause us to, to worry or cause us to doubt. And so where can we find hope in the midst of that difficulty? Where can we find hope in the midst of those fears? Certainly not in the king of the world uh, like King Herod was, or any, any king of the world like, like King Herod was. Remember last week, we, we saw as we were going through the book of Acts chapter 12, we saw that, that, that evil King Herod, Herod Agrippa I, he was now down in Caesarea. And here's what happened next in this incredible account of history. So in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, we're going to read these next, these next six verses. But, but see what happens if you put your hope in the wrong place, like the people at the beginning of this verse did, or the beginning of this section, you're, you're going to be disappointed. So chapter 12, verse 20, it says that he had been very angry with the Ty Tyrians and Sidonians. Together they presented themselves before him, and having won over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. And so, in other words, what happened there is they knew that going to war with King Herod would not have been good for their country. It wouldn't have been good for them. It wouldn't have accomplished anything. And so they had this fear of this. And so, in a sense, they're, they're putting their hope in this king. And we'll see what happens as a result of that. So on an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a public address to them. The populace began to shout, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. So the, the well-known and widely trusted Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote about this event in detail. And it's really interesting if you read it, how much it lines up with exactly this really short account here. But he, what, what Josephus said is he talked more about this account, this event that happened. Uh, sure enough, he said Herod was in Caesarea during this time and that he was in this theater with, with really good acoustics. And the sun, remember, they didn't have a sound system back then. They couldn't amplify his voice with speakers like we can do, and they couldn't wear a microphone. But there was these really good acoustics in this theater, and the sun was reflecting off his robes as he spoke. And because he sounded so good and the sun was shining off of his robes, the people really thought that he was a god. They, they thought, this, this is no ordinary man as he spoke. And so look what happens then. At once, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God and he became infected with worms and died. I didn't notice anyone mentioning that being their greatest fear, being eaten by worms. And it's interesting, so Josephus talked about this too. He said, and he couldn't explain it, he said that the king was suddenly struck with a stomach illness and later died. And so he talked about this as well. Herod probably didn't have this on his, on his list. He probably didn't think, you know, I hope I don't ever get die by getting eaten from the inside out by worms. But that's exactly what happened. So verse 24 then God's message flourished and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem after they had completed their relief mission, on which they took John Mark. 
Father God, we pray for wisdom this morning, that we would understand the truth of your word, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would convict us, that you would help us, Father, to turn from our evil ways, any temptations that would cause us to look elsewhere besides you for hope, that you would help us to look to you, to trust you, to depend on you. Father, we pray for wisdom to not only understand the truth of your word, but also, Father, that we would apply it rightly to our lives, that we would not just see this as a history lesson, but that we would really be convicted to turn from sin and follow you wholeheartedly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Dennis, we need to get the sermon up there, if you don't mind. There you go. So, uh, did, did anyone, when we're reading through that, did you notice that what happens when our hope is placed in the wrong place, right? And that, that's really what I want you to notice today as we go through this passage. You see, the book of Acts is one of the best books in the Bible for seeing and understanding our purpose. When we say that our passion is the gospel, our church is our family, our world is our mission. So today we're going to look at the hope of our purpose. When we think about this, why, what, what is the hope and why do we have that hope that causes our passion to be the gospel, that would cause our church to be our family, that would cause our world to be our mission? Why is the hope that it is for those things? In other words, if we have the right hope, then we will be passionate about the gospel. We will be focused on, on serving our, and loving our church family, and we will want to be on mission. And so my purpose in the message today is that you will look to God's word for hope. Our purpose comes from his word. Right? True hope is found in his word. So stop trying to hope in things that push you away from God or that push you away from the truth of his word. Instead, look to his word, trust his word, obey his word. And so from this short historical account that we just read, I mean, just a, a short glimpse of what happened, I want you to consider two reasons to trust God's timing and victory. To have hope in God according to his word, we have to do this, right? We have to trust God's timing. We have to trust in God's victory. Temptations to look elsewhere are everywhere. Don't give in to those temptations. Temptations to prioritize everything else are constant. Oh, no, you don't need to prioritize church or prioritize time and God's word or prioritize sharing your faith. And there's going to be those temptations to, to, to look to other things, but don't give in. Right? Trust God's timing and victory because, firstly, I want you to notice, as we see in the beginning of the story here, worldly hope fails. Every time it eventually worldly hope fails. Sure, there are lots of victories the world has to offer, right? Lots of reasons to gloat. Lots of reasons to celebrate. Talking to you, Chiefs fans. Lots of reasons, temporary as they may be, lots of reasons to make it about yourself. But, but this all leads to failure eventually. So why would you settle for that? We know this. If we've come to know Jesus, we know that these things eventually let us down. And yet we settle for less than what God has for us. Don't settle for less than God's plan. Don't settle for less than God's glory. You might accomplish things, and you might start to receive praise, and then you might be tempted to think, hmm, look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look what we've done. But we know the reality, the truth, according to the Bible, is that pride leads to devastation. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. See, this is what happened to Herod, and it can happen to anyone. We certainly can't look at this story and think, ha, dummy, I'm glad I'm not like King Herod. Right? We can't look at that and say that and then without recognizing that apart from the grace of God, we are Herod. This is us, if not for the grace of God. We are the fools because of our sin who would think too much of ourselves, failing to put our hope in God's word, and then ending in destruction. Worldly hope fails. There's no exceptions to this. Herod had it all according to the world until he didn't. Things were going great until they weren't. And that's how it always is until it isn't. Right? Herod had just about everything the Roman world could offer him, but he was still under the sovereign control of the king of kings. And unfortunately for him, he didn't realize or he didn't believe that. And so when he failed to humble himself, when he instead thought too much of himself, when, they, when the people were giving him the glory and he didn't give it back to God, verse 23, at once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God and he became infected with worms and died. Talk about humiliating and disgusting and heartbreaking that this man who had so much just like that, it's over. 
the ruler who was so powerful was reduced to nothing. And it's interesting because when you read Josephus' account of this, that Jewish historian, that's what he said. At the end of it, he said this, I don't remember the exact words, but he basically said this ruler who had accomplished so much in his life was just like that, like, like he was nothing. Just gone. Don't be a prideful, sinful fool like Herod. Ask for God for his grace and for his help that you might live for and serve him, that you might give him the glory. Worldly hope will only fail you. Instead of responding to praise and idolatry like Herod did, respond like Paul and Barnabas did when people called them gods. We're going to see this in a few weeks, but in chapter 14, that member, if you, if you know the story, they were, they were praising, kind of trying to worship Paul and Barnabas, saying that they thought they were, they were Zeus and Hermes, and they thought they were these Greek gods, and they were worshiping them. And this was their response. Men, why are you doing these things? We are men also with the same nature as you, and we are proclaiming good news to you that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You, you, you notice what they did? Quickly, they took the attention off themselves and said, no. We're just people like you. God is the one. He made all of this. God is the one you need to give the glory to. Kids, today in the family group lesson from Matthew 21 in the Gospel Project, who did you learn is the king of all kings? Who did it, who did it emphasize? Yeah, pretty. that's not a trick question. Right? It's Jesus. That we, remember, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was yet another reminder that he is the Messiah, that he is the king of what, in that time, what country? The king of what? Kids, the king of, I'll give you a hint. One of, the, one of Pastor Robert's uh, kids is named this. The king of Israel, good. The king of Israel. So, yeah, he was, you're right, the king of the Jews, but he's fulfilling that prophecy that he would come. And, and of course, they misunderstood it, and they thought he was going to be an earthly king who would take over the Roman Empire and fix everything for them and fix their problems in a worldly sense, with worldly hope. But, no, he came to solve our eternal problems, the problems of sin and death. And so not only is he the king of Israel, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is worthy of our worship. He alone is worthy. And so when we take his glory and we put it on ourselves, or when somebody else tries to put it on us and we receive that, or when we put it on anyone else but him, that makes us deserving of death. And praise God that he hasn't struck us all down because we'd all be dead right now if he did what he did to King Herod when we deserved it because we've all been there, we've all deserved it. Perhaps even this morning, before we came into this building, we deserved it. And yet, by God's grace and mercy, he protects us from that. He delivers us from that, especially when we seek him, when we turn to him, when we trust in him. But do you see the power theme in this chapter as well, here in chapter 12? Herod, seemingly demonstrating his power over the church by killing James the apostle and then putting Peter on death row, and so he's trying to demonstrate his power. He sees the people like it, and then he, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill Peter next. And so he's trying to demonstrate his power. But then God demonstrated his power by miraculously freeing Peter. And then Herod again demonstrated his power over the nation states, right? The, Tyro the Tyrians and the Sidonians, and he, he looked at me, and, they, and you know, they knew they needed him, and so he's demonstrating his power over them. But then God again demonstrates his power, his power that Herod is no match for. God always wins. Don't be like Herod and fail to repent and turn to the Lord. If you've struggled to trust and follow God, be like Nebuchadnezzar at the end of Daniel 4. Right? Remember that story? Nebuchadnezzar, before it was too late, he turned to the Lord. God might not settle accounts immediately, but he will eternally. He will settle accounts. Trust God's timing. Trust God's victory because worldly hope fails. Secondly, I want you to notice that hope in God flourishes. His word, his message, his plan, his victory, he never fails. Consider all the things against the gospel flourishing and multiplying. What we've read so far, just in this chapter. Just consider all the things that are, that are wrong. People being killed, people being put in prison. The wrong guy in charge, a guy who hates Christians. The, the Jews want to stop Christianity. All of these things against the gospel flourishing, and yet that's exactly what happened. No matter how bad things might seem, persecution, suffering, difficulty, being on the verge of war, which is what we were at here at the beginning of this section. All of these bad things, and yet still, God is in control. We, we look around us and we see the mess that is in this world. We see the difficulty that's all over and we sometimes fail to recognize, fail to trust, fail to see God is still in control. 
And so verse 24, then God's message flourished and multiplied. Remember, this king whose grandfather slaughtered babies because he was trying to kill Jesus as a toddler, and then this whose uncle, remember his uncle beheaded John the Baptist, and then he himself, this king, King Herod himself, he killed the apostles James, he was planning to kill Peter. This guy was in charge, but only as far as God let him be in charge. All these crazy circumstances, all of these obstacles for the church growing and the gospel advancing, and yet God's message flourished and multiplied. Hope in God flourishes. This verse 24, it's the fourth progress report in the book of Acts. There's six of them. The other, uh, there's seven of them, actually. The other six are in your notes. So if, you, if you're taking notes or on the back of the bulletin or in your app, you'll notice cross-references. And there's six verses in Acts. These are progress reports throughout the book of Acts that show God's plans cannot be thwarted. His gospel will continue to spread. The church will not be defeated. And so we see that throughout this book, and this is one of them here. And so hope in God flourishes, which means the gospel spreads. The powerful King Herod, he fell, but God didn't fall. God's word didn't fall. The gospel didn't fall. God's church didn't fall. Those who were in opposition to God fell. And then look at verse 25, a mission completed. Are you kidding me? A mission completed in the midst of this suffering and persecution and difficulty, and it says they completed their mission? In that world, yes, because hope in God flourishes. And so they could complete the mission that God had for them. And what a great reminder as we look at this last verse we read in verse 25. What a great reminder of what our responsibility is in this crazy world. Right? Our job is to keep moving forward in faith. No matter the difficulty that surrounds us, no matter the suffering that might come, our job is to keep moving forward, to keep doing what God has called us to do, to be disciples who are making disciples. Keep trusting God. Keep being his witnesses. Keep bringing others along with us. That's what they're doing. Put your hope in God. Hope in him flourishes. The world may seem dark. The world may seem hopeless, but hope in God flourishes. He won't let you down. Trust him. Follow him. I love the hymn that we're going to sing in a little bit here. It's called The Mighty Fortress is Our God. A lot of you have heard of it. It's in our hymnal. Uh, if you grew up in church, you might know this. A mighty fortress is our God. It's one of my favorites, and I love how it speaks of the hope that we're talking about today here in chapter 12 of the book of Acts, because it reminds us that our enemy is real. It reminds us that sin and death are real. It reminds us that judgment is certain. We're going we're gonna to sing that in this song, but we also read about it here in Acts chapter 12. But everyone who knows the Lord has hope, because everyone who knows the Lord has victory. In that song, the words are so true, all of them. But look at the ending to the song. The ending to the song, it says, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. The problems are real. Suffering is real. Evil is real. Physical death is real. But God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. There's no other kingdom that's forever. The USA will one day be no more. As great of a country as it is, the USA is temporary. But God's kingdom is forever. And so no matter what happens, no matter the difficulties we face, no matter the suffering that there is, his kingdom is forever. And that's where we have to have our hope. We can't put our hope in politicians or in sports teams or even in family or careers, things that are good, that we strive for, that we love, that we should love. But we can't put our hope in those things. Because his kingdom is forever, and his kingdom alone is forever. Remember I said my purpose today is that you will look to God's word for hope. Be honest. When you think of your greatest fears, when you think of the worries or the concerns, maybe there's even some that have been popping in your mind throughout the morning, things that you're concerned about. When you think of those things, where are you looking for answers? Where are you finding hope, or, or where are you trying to find hope? And maybe you're not finding it because you're looking in the wrong place. If you're not looking to God and to his word, then you're going to be disappointed. Maybe not now. Maybe initially you'll get some hope. You'll get some relief. You'll get some, those little victories. But eventually, disappointment will come if you're not looking to God and to his word. God's design alone, God's creation, God's way is perfect. But we all sin. We all fall short of his perfect plan. And sin leads to brokenness. 
right? Not only the kind of brokenness that causes people to get eaten by worms and die, I mean, talk about the epitome of disgusting brokenness, but, but so often, isn't brokenness a lot more subtle than that? Slowly but surely, brokenness that destroys relationships, brokenness that destroys lives, brokenness that ruins marriages, brokenness that, that tears apart families, brokenness that s- destroys churches. Why? Because of our sin. Most importantly, then, as a result of our sin, is a broken relationship with God, which means that we all deserve to spend eternity in hell because our relationship with a perfect God is broken by our sin. And there's only one thing that can fix our brokenness, and that's the gospel. The good news that Jesus died in our place on the cross for our sins. He died because of our brokenness. And on the third day, the Bible tells us and history verifies that Jesus rose from the dead, that he won the victory over sin and death forever. So now if you simply repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus alone for forgiveness and salvation, he will give you a new life. He will restore your relationship with God. He will make you right with God. Turning from your sin and surrounding your life to Jesus is the only way to be saved from brokenness now and brokenness for eternity. Now, recognize we're still broken. We're not there yet, but we're being changed Day by day, we're being changed. And so what happens is, as God changes your heart through the work of his Holy Spirit in your life, you begin to recover and pursue that perfect plan and purpose that God has for your life. You're no longer content to go down those broken roads. You're no longer content to pursue the broken ways, but rather you want to honor and glorify God. And when, when, when you're tempted to, and you stumble and you fall and you sin, you right back, you say, God, I don't want to be on that path. I want to walk with you. You'll never be the same again when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so please, if you're here this morning and you haven't yet repented of your sins and believed in Jesus alone to forgive you, please don't leave here without making that decision today. But then for those of you who had trusted in Jesus, who knows about this hope? Are you praying for God's help to be a shining light? As First Peter says, that, that so that they would ask, what is the reason for the hope that is within you? And you're ready to give an answer. You're ready to testify of what God has done in your life, that that he is your hope. Are you praying for others to experience this hope? The hope of our purpose can only be God as revealed in his word. There is no other hope that defines who we are as individual followers of Jesus and as a church. Before we get ready to sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, I want you to look at the words to verse 2 as we're going to sing. It says, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing. Just like Herod, is that not a, a sense of what happened in verse of, of Acts chapter 12? Right? If you stay with Jesus, you win. You go against him, you lose. And so if we're trying to do things in our own strength, we lose. So did we in our own strength confide or striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Oh, here we go. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus. It is he Right? It is he, Christ Jesus, it is he, the Lord Sabaoth, which, by the way, that just means the Lord of hosts. It's a fancy way of saying the Lord of hosts. So the Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, he must win the battle. And he has. He has when he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead, and he's coming back in eternal victory. His kingdom is forever. That is where our hope must be. Father God, we pray for your help to make our hope, to put our hope in you according to your word, in your kingdom that will be forever, that is forever, that is already established and will be fully realized when Jesus comes again. Thank you, Father, for the, as some pastor once said, the now but not yet, recognizing that right now we get to experience your kingdom, but not fully yet, not until Jesus comes again. Thank you for the victory that is in Jesus. Thank you for the mighty fortress that is our God. Please help those today who are here who haven't yet trusted in Jesus to take away their sins and to forgive them and to to make them new. Please, right now as we pray, give them the desire in their minds and in their hearts to cry out to you to ask for your help, to ask for your salvation, to ask for your forgiveness, to ask for their hearts to be made new and help them to recognize they don't have to fix the things around. They don't have to fix themselves. They have to cry out to you and you will fix everything. 
Slowly but surely, sometimes we, we see that change, but we recognize that eternally it will be perfect. So we thank you for the work that you do in the hearts of those who call on your name. Please give everyone in here desire today to truly trust that your kingdom is forever, that you are the mighty fortress who is our God. You are the one our hope is in. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.